Take a seat. Just pray for Mike. Father, we we thank you for Mike. And we thank you for the the anointing that you've placed upon him. Lord, and as he comes to share your word this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would just descend upon him now, Lord. Lord, fill him to overflowing and communicate your word to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, a few things I just wanted. We're going to be in Revelation 21, and we're going to be going from verse 9 uh, through to the end of that chapter. So if you want to find that. And just while you're finding that, there's a, a few things during the worship that came to mind. Uh, one of those was uh, in Scripture, we're told not to say who is going up and who is going down. And, uh, and I just feel that's for some people today, uh, that you know, you've lost people. And, and it's really tough. And as we come to talk about heaven, the first question that comes to mind is, will they be there? Will they not be there? And there's probably no hope that person is going to be there. And I, we're told in Scripture not to do that. And, and I think the reason we're told not to do that is because no one knows what secret meeting with God people will have. And I think we just need to say that we leave that to the Lord. And there's, um, there's many testimonies of people that have died and no one has known about it in other parts of the world where their family are on the other side of the world where they've had an encounter with God and come back. And I think what I want to say to you today is leave it with the Lord. So as we come to talk about heaven, don't be sitting there thinking, oh, so-and-so is not going to be there. Leave it with the Lord. And hopefully within it, I'll be able to share some scripture that will help you have some comfort as to whether you will be in crisis in heaven or not. So we'll come to that. So If you turn your Bibles to Revelation 21, we are going to continue looking at heaven. So verse 9 going onwards, it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. As long as it was wide, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and a city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Caveat here, I can't pronounce all of these very well, so just get over it. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was agate, the fourth was emerald, the fifth was onyx, the sixth was ruby, the seventh was chrysolite, the eighth was beryl, and the ninth was topaz, and the tenth was turquoise, the the eleventh was jacinth, I think, and the twelfth was amethyst. Not bad. Give me a clap. Thanks. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. 
Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does it what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, there is so much in this today. We pray that you'll bring out what we need and help us to have comfort wherever we are in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start by showing you a very short video. So let's play that video. I'm on no commission whatsoever. <laughs> You're probably thinking, why is he showing us those videos? When I was growing up, uh, I had some friends and family that used to sit me through the videos of all the Disneyland water parks. And there were loads. That, that was just one or two, but there were loads. And these parks were amazing. I mean, some of them had snow effects. Some of them had these slides going through all these terrains. It looked so fun, just as you've just seen. And I would sit there in absolute awe as a child going, wow, this is amazing. My friend were going, yeah, we're going there. We're going there. And they'd come back with their, 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 their little, uh, what are they called? Chicago Bulls uh, caps and their, their overly sized uh, basketball tops and had all these stuff that they bought while they were out there. And it would just been, wow. And you'd sit there going, you're so amazing. And I'd sit there holding this awe with truth, which would be, we will never afford to be able to go there, ever. And as I got older, I'm now at that place of, I don't really want to go there anyway. <laughs> but it was this idea that I was seeing for me as a child, that was heaven. I'm seeing these slides and all these things and everything you've just seen on there and more, because that's just two of them. And I was just like, this is heaven to me. It's amazing. I want to go there, but I can't afford to go there. There's one good news about heaven for you, and that is that you can afford to go there. Every single one of you can afford to go there because Jesus has paid the price. Not only has he paid your fares, it is fully inclusive. You can go there. It costs you nothing. And it's better than that. Much better. I'm still wondering, will there be slides like that? I'm hoping. <laughs> Lord, I sacrificed it on earth. Why, you know, why can't I have it in heaven? You know, but that's it. What is heaven to you? What, what do you think? What does it bring up in you? Are you fascinated by it? Are, are, you, are you even bothered by it? I come to church. It's sort of like a hedge protection around me so that I know that I'm going somewhere where I die. What is heaven to you? What does it do? Because for me, when I read about heaven, I get so excited. I see and I think, this is going to be amazing. There's going to be no deceit. There's going to be no death. There's going to be no, no nothing bad. It's all going to be amazing. And we're just going to have so much fun worshiping the Lord. And we're going to be free of everything with no worries ever again. And it's going to be beautiful. What do you think of when you think of heaven? Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, well, I'm fascinated by heaven. And then others of you are sitting there thinking, well, actually, Christianity is like an insurance for me. Just in case heaven is real and Jesus really does rule it, I'll go there. I'll keep it like that. Come to church every now and then. I'm not going to serve much. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to come to church, say I'm a Christian, and that gives me a route in. I've got that insurance around me. And then others of you might be sitting there today thinking, I don't even believe in it. You might even be here, maybe a husband or a wife or someone that comes to church, and you're one of those really nice people who comes with them even though you don't believe it, although you might be slightly open, but you come because you're just a really nice spouse. And I honor you today, all right? I do. But you might be sitting there not bothered about it, don't really believe in it. Don't really believe that when you die, anything happens. Let me read you something that has been uh, really on my heart recently. This is a, a report that I read recently. Advanced forms of cardiac and neurosurgery 
made possible only in recent decades, require the patient to be put into a state of reversible clinical death. Upon res uh, resuscitation, a significant number of patients begin to describe in verifiable ways, having been conscious, conscience, conscious, that's the word, during surgery, despite having no detectable brain waves or heartbeat, observing from the ceiling. The question is, what do you make of it? This is common. This is common. There are hundreds of thousands, if not more, of people that have died and have come back and have given verifiable evidence that they were not gone and that they were floating above from the ceiling watching everything that was happening to them in that room. I know one story of one guy that was able to tell the nurses where his glasses were, which they put in a drawer and wheeled down the hallway into another room, and he was dead. That should be quite interesting to you. You look dead, all right? <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is scientists are now, and doctors are coming up with this really baffling report of when people are put into death, they're coming back and telling us things that we can verify actually happened whilst they were not here, like they were watching everything we're doing. What does that uh, say to you today? Is it really worth taking the chance, spending your life, saying to everyone, don't believe it, don't believe it, won't believe it, not going to believe it, you lot are stupid and mad. Is it worth taking that chance at not being open to the fact that life goes on beyond the grave? Because Jesus proved it did, and the world knows that it does. So I leave you with that thought for now. It's not the end of the sermon. You'll be unhappy to know. So as we go into this and we unpack it, don't sit there thinking this Christianity stuff is a load of rubbish. Sit there thinking, what if it's real? And if it's real, what might happen? And let me explain to you what heaven is going to be like. We start with verse 9. In verse 9, we, uh, we see this lovely angel. I call him the oxymoron angel. Because you see that it starts with this angel who was the angel that poured out the last plagues. Do you remember that? The bowls of God's wrath. So here he is pouring out God's wrath. Now he's got a new job. He is a heavenly tour guide. Now think about that for a moment. Man pours out wrath. Now he is the tour guide for heaven. Man looks angry. Now he's saying, come with me. I'll show you the glories of heaven. Come. You know. Doesn't that feel like a bit of an oxymoron? How does he go from wrath to tour guide? Well, the answer is this. We do not understand what good really is. We're sitting there going, how can he be good if he can pour out wrath and now he's showing people around heaven? How does that work? How can God be good if he cannot save everyone? He doesn't let everyone in, although he's in called them all into his kingdom. Not everyone's going to come. How can he be good if he pours out wrath on this earth? How can he be good if he lets all of these bad things happen on the earth? And the answer is this. We do not know what good truly is. Because Jesus himself said, how can you say I'm good? No one is good save God alone. In other words, every single one of you in this room, including me, does not know what good is, and we cannot judge what good is because we have never been good. Do you understand that? Think about it like this for a minute. If I came to you today, uh, you came to me and said, Mike, I'm going to buy a car. I'm going to buy a car. I need you to come with me, have a look at it, and tell me if it's a good car to buy. And I'll say, yeah, I'll come. No problem. Here it is, Mike. What do you think? It's a great car. Buy it. Spend your, your life savings on that car. You'll be great. And it'll break down a week later. Was I a good person to ask? I don't know anything about a car. I can't change a brake pad. I sometimes struggle to turn the thing on. You know, I can make it move. I can make it stop just about. I am not the man. I cannot be the judge of what is a good car and what isn't. Same thing as you guys. You are not good. I am not good. So you cannot judge what is good. So when you see this angel and you start to be critical and say, or oh, you've asked God, you know, how can he do this? How can he do that? You have no place to do that because you are not good. But just to help you, God cleanses the earth of all evil and sin. Is that a good thing? Just think that through for a minute. Is it good that at the end of time, God is going to cleanse the whole world of evil? Are you happy with that? 
With it is going to go the cancers. With it is going to go the death. With it is going to go all the abusers and the abuses. They're all going to go. They're all gone. He's going to make a world, a new world that is a perfect world. Is that a good thing? In order to wipe the earth of all the bad, some people are going to go with it because they refuse to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus even though God has given them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. But many will say, how can God do that to those people? You are not good. You cannot judge. He is good. And he has given in his goodness every opportunity for every single human being, no matter how much bad they've done, the opportunity to turn and be saved. But still, people will refuse. So that's why when we see this angel who pours out the wrath of God and cleanses the earth, that is why we cannot judge what is good. Think of it like this. Every opportunity has been given. First of all, the gospel. The gospel of peace and redemption through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. There it is. God brings that and still people refuse. So first you have the gospel, then you have the bowls of wrath. First of all, he's here. Here's my love. This is what I love you so much. Turn back to me. No, 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 we're not doing it. So then comes that, okay, this is my wrath, but the wrath does not destroy them. It leaves a place open for them to go, okay, I got this wrong. I'll turn back. And still it says they refuse to repent and they hide under the rocks. God is good. He's tried in every way by showing wrath and showing goodness and the gospel, and still they will not turn. So when you come to think about how could a good God do that, he's a good God who's tried every way in the end. No one will miss out on heaven if they truly turn to God. Everyone is being given the opportunity. I could read to you right now Romans 1 that talks about the God's goodness and his real Uh, His godliness is shown throughout the world in everything, all of creation, and how the world has turned away and refused to follow God. And it goes on to say that in that they have have given up on natural relationships, uh, men between women, and given over themselves to having relationships with man and man and woman and woman. And it goes on to talk about it and talk about the fact that God's wrath is upon this stuff, and this is the stuff that the church is given into. Because in a world, and we're told that these things will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the truth. You can put those two verses together. And what you find is that we in the world think we know what is good. And we think we know what God should be teaching in the world and the church should be accepting. But what we don't realize, God is not asking what we should accept. He's asking us to give everything we are, everything we believe to him and yield. Even if it means that we will not do the things we want to do or we think that we have the right to do, we're saying we will do what you want to do because we're here for just a short time. He is good, we are not. How do we judge what is good and what isn't? So there's the oxymoron angel for you and then we move to heaven. Let's have a look and unpack heaven. So if we go to verse 10, moving on from the angel in verse 9, let's read what it says. It says, and he carried me away. We'll go up to 14. He carried me away in the spirit to the mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. You know what we see here, as Justin talked about the new heavens and the new earth last week. We'll just cover that a little bit as well. We see the first book of the Bible, Genesis, being remade in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And let me just spell it out to you. So first of all, we see God made the heavens and the earth in Genesis. God makes a new heaven and earth in Revelation. God created the sun in Genesis. There is no sun needed in heaven in Revelation. He established the night. There is no night in Revelation in the new heaven. He see that we, we see the sea created in Genesis, but in heaven there is no sea. Just a point on that. Is it uh, symbolic? Is it metaphoric? Is it actual no sea? The truth is we don't know. The answer is it's probably symbolism. It is probably, as Justin said, symbolism of the chaos on the earth that will be ended. But 
C also represents divided communities. It also means that you have to travel across the world to get to different countries and nations. And it may well be there won't be any C and that we will just be able to walk from place to place. I don't know. We cannot absolutely say, but I would probably go as Justin did with the symbolism. A curse is announced in Genesis and we see that there is no more curse in heaven. Death enters history in Genesis. Death is gone in heaven. Man is driven away from the Garden of Eden. Man is restored in Revelation to paradise. And the word paradise is translated garden. Interesting, right? Genesis, there is sorrow and pain. And they begin there. In Revelation, there is no more tears and no more pain. Everything is made new. From Genesis, we get to Revelation in heaven. It is the making new of the garden, but it's not the same garden. If you look at uh, the Bible several times, uh, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one of my words will pass away. The other thing is we see, I think through Peter, it talks about the, the elements of the earth will be burned up and will melt away. The heavens and the earth will be new. It's going to be new. Are you excited about the new? We're going to hear all about that in just a second. But what I want to share with you is a scripture in Isaiah that I think is really helpful for us. And there's a few of these today that we're going to look at. Let me just find it for you. If you get there first, raise your hand. You'll get a prize. No, I beat you. There we go. So listen to this. This is Isaiah. And uh, it's 65, 17 to 19. It says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a daylight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Do you know what really stands out in that passage for me? Are you concerned about the people that may not have made it to heaven? Are you Are thinking that in heaven you're going to be mourning for the rest of time and you're going to be really sad because you got there and some people didn't? Listen to this. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Just remember that. That if we're not able to cry in heaven, you're not able to be sad. You're not going to be holding it in. God doesn't tell us to bottle up our feelings. You know, you're going to be okay. And you're going to be absolutely delighted. But in this meantime, make sure that you invite people to be where you're going. That's the most important thing. But you're not going to be sad and you can't question God, but you can question him, but you'll be wrong. He is good. And in the end, the right people will end up in the right place because God is good. And I really firmly believe that. So let's talk about these precious stones and the gold and everything else that went with it. These precious stones, if you go back and you look in, I think it's uh, Exodus somewhere, uh, it, I think it's 28, 29, it talks about the priestly garment. And the priestly garment has got all of these stones on it. So what you're finding is the 12 tribes of Israel are everywhere in heaven. You see that they're represented in so many ways. And what you find is that the, they're transparent. Why would they be transparent? Why is it so important that most of heaven is made up of transparent? Even the gold is transparent like gold, a glass. Why is that important? It's because it reflects the glory of God throughout the whole of heaven. That where he shines, every part of heaven will shine with his glory. If, if, if this was heaven, this stage would be shining with God's glory. The grass will shine with his glory. Everywhere you go, his light and his life that comes through his light will be gleaming and glistening from everything you look at. It will be the most beautiful thing. And not only will it look good, the life that will come off of him will be going through you. And that's why you'll never be able to feel any tears or any sadness because every time you ever tried to think about it, the goodness of God will bring you to an absolute undone feeling. It's a brilliant thought, isn't it? That every day when you get up and you think, oh, I'm feeling sad, you won't get that anymore. You won't worry about anything. You will just be so in awe of God and feel his presence everywhere you go. You will be free because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Transparency through everything. 
I don't embarrass him here. I won't point him out. But our good, wise caretaker, Kevin, uh, this will prove to you that I listened to him. Because about 10 years ago, he asked me a question. And I still remember it to this day. And he said, Mike, if we're not meant to chase after gold and all of these precious things on earth, why are they so prominent in heaven? It's a good question, isn't it? You know, we're saying, oh, don't idolize this. Don't idolize that. Don't chase these things. Do, you know, put God first. The fact is this. In heaven, all the things we fight over, all the things we idolize, all the things that we want and spend our money on or crave, or like my video up there going, you know, I want this. They're just commonplace up there. They're not precious, although they say they're precious, but they're just normal. They're everywhere. You won't need to fight over them because the whole place is made of them. You know, David Reeves, let's embarrass him for a moment. He tried to tell me a joke once. It took me about five minutes to get. And um, I think it's the way he told it with a deadpan face. And... um, (laughs) But he said, Micah, you know, there was a man that came into heaven and uh, he came across St. Peter. I'm probably telling this wrong, David, sorry, if you're here. And uh, he said, uh, he came to heaven and uh, and St. Peter said to him, "Uh, what have you got to declare? And the guy said, just my gold. And Peter says to him, why have you brought pavement with you? Ah, yeah, see, David, I told you it was rubbish. The streets are going to be made of the things that people kill over. They're just going to be commonplace. You're not going to be running around saying, oh, I can't wait to get a hold. I'm going to get a gold necklace. What, you're going to dig it up? Well, you really want a golden necklace? The most amazing thing in heaven is not gold or stones. It's Jesus and his light going through you and the life that he gives you. The things on earth that we cherish and the things on earth we idolize are just going to be worthless. I was uh, treating myself to a bit of David Attenborough this week. And, uh, you know, I get all the exciting things and, and uh, the, the, the earth-free thing that he's been doing. And they, he was talking about sand dunes. And sand dunes, you know, they've got billions of sand moving around. And if you listen carefully, uh, you can hear it. And, and at times it will sound like a cello. You know, so I got here last week when we had uh, Julian and his cello up here, and I was thinking, ain't all that and a bag of chips, is it? Because I heard it on David Attenborough today by just listening to the sand. And what it's really telling us is this, is that the, the whole of heaven is going to declare his glory. By the way, it is all that and a bag of chips. I'll be honest, because I, I love the cello. But what we're saying is when we read in Scripture that... The heavens declare the glory of God. It's actually true that the earth at the moment still declares the glory of God. It's beautiful. It's beautiful what heaven and earth sound like. Listen to this in Psalm 19. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Speech. David Ambrose was saying that the sand, when it makes that cello sound, is like it's singing Like creation is singing. And I'm sitting there going, David, you ain't got long left. Take the hint, mate. You've seen more than we have. (laughs) Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Isn't that beautiful? That what we see is what God has made here sings of his glory. And when we get to heaven, it will sing even more of his glory. There'll be no temple in heaven. But heaven is a cube shape. Why? Because the temple, the holy of holies within the temple is a cube shape. And it's a beautiful place where God dwells. But it's not needed in heaven because God will dwell with his people in the city. And the city of Jerusalem will be his. That everything in it will be dwelled by God. The city will be his holy of holies. That's why it is a cube shape. We have the 12 gates with the 12 tribes written on it. Isn't it beautiful that the 12 tribes are mentioned everywhere here? And the reason being is it tells us that when God makes a covenant, when God makes a promise to his people, he never forgets it. He never breaks it. It means that when you give your life, gave your life, wherever you are, to Jesus Christ, it is irreversible. He will never forget you. He has got you etched into his city. And I'll prove it because that was the 12 tribes of Israel. But then we have on the foundations of it, we have the names of the apostles. God honors his apostles. 
He honors his apostles because the whole of the redemptive plan was built on his apostles, through him, through his apostles. The only question you have to ask is, who will the 12th one be since uh, Judas went? And would it be Matthias or will it be Paul? I think it'll be Paul because we don't hear anything from Matthias and I'm still not convinced by the casting of lots, but that's just where I am. But what it tells you is something even more beautiful. That the 12 tribes are mentioned and the church through the apostles and what it tells us is exactly what Romans repeats to us is that this, God is making one new family out of the Old Testament and the New, out of the Jews and the Gentiles, and that his promise will never vanish. He's making a new Jerusalem, a new family, a new people where his son Jesus will be the head, and that God will reign and rule through him and through us. Isn't it beautiful? And then when we move on, we see also in here that the angel measures the new Jerusalem very much like Ezekiel. We see that in Ezekiel when he measures the temple and the water comes out of the temple. But what we find is he measures it to 12,000 stadia. Do you know how big that is? It's about the size of the moon, just, just short of the moon. In other words, the city of God is going to be the size almost of the moon. That's a big city, isn't it? You're not going to build a city like that here. New York's not that big, is it? But what it tells us is there is enough room for you, your family, your friends, and your enemies. And what it's telling us is that God has made it so big that you need to spend your time inviting more people to it because he's got room for everyone. That everyone you love can go to heaven. Everyone you hate, which you shouldn't do, they can also go to heaven. So you just start working on them as well. Heaven is going to be a beautiful place full of people. And this word heaven is uranos in the Greek. And what it means is everything in the night sky. It doesn't mean just the sky as people translate. It means everything in the night sky, meaning the whole universe. And what it means is perhaps we are going to have a new universe to explore. I can't say that for sure. But it might be. There's a possibility that everything you see up there beyond the clouds and beyond the sky are going to be available to you. You will not be limited like you are here. And as scripture tells us, it says what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind can conceive, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed by his spirit. He's revealing it here in John. You know, when you hear some people, uh, we've, I was talking earlier about the fact that people come back to life and, and, you know, having the cardiac and they're looking down on everything. We also have a, a book called Imagine Heaven that's got uh, just many, many stories of people that have met with God and come to faith in death and seen heaven. Uh, you think about the jellyfish man, Ian McCormack, and his incredible t- testimony many years ago. You can look it up online. And you hear about these guys meeting with God. And the first thing you'll find is the legalistic religious people go, oh, no, that doesn't happen. Scripture says it doesn't happen. I'm sitting there thinking, well, what is John writing about then? He's writing about something he can see in heaven right now. He's still alive. What about Paul? He says, I was caught up into the third heaven. He wasn't saying there were three heavens. He was saying beyond the sky, there is a place where God dwells, and I got to go there and see it. So don't deny, because you want to be religious, and you want to be stuck in your ways, that God might reveal heaven to people today. But one of the things you need to know is it exists. And he loves you and he's got that place prepared for you. And what would it be like? It will be no more death, no more tears, no more separation. And God will be everywhere. You won't have to worry about food anymore. That the leaves, no, I'm not going to talk about the leaves on the tree because that's in next week's scripture. But it's going to be amazing. Like even you miserable lot are going to smile when you get there. I I cannot even believe it. That you're going to be wetting yourself with joy. Right now, you're probably thinking, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills this week. I, I don't know. I, I need to buy that new car that I want. And do I want an iPad or an iPod or whatever? You know, you've all got these things going through your head. Do you know heaven is coming? It's real. Do you know the end is coming? Like, there's some of you living under a rock? 
Like, I just want to point out that we are, but every time we talk about Bible prophecy, everyone's like, oh, these things have been happening for years. Do you realize that the Bible tells us in Ezekiel, everything that's going to happen, we're told that the, the, the nation of Israel will become a nation again in one day, which happened in 1948. So every time we say, oh, this has all happened before, that had never happened. And now it has happened. And now we're on the ticking time to the end. And then, you know, again, you see all these things going on and the pestilences and things like that just increasing. And then when you read Ezekiel, it talks about all the nations that will join with Russia, the uh, Rush in the north, and they will come together. And guess what the nation is? It's Persia. Who is Persia? It's the country that changed its name to Iran. And all of the star nations will join together and go against Israel. We get closer every day. And if we're getting closer every day, guess what? Heaven's getting closer every day. So you can get excited that one day soon you are going to be in a place where there is no more tears and no more death. And if no one captures that, I'm going to kick you. Come on. (laughs) It's important that you read the scripture and believe it. Stop turning up to church and just doing the church thing. Getting your Bibles and say, God, I love this. I love you. And yeah, I'll give up anything to follow you. It's coming. Shall I read it or not? Looking at the time, I might read it. I just, I want to do more damage. Let's do it. (laughs) This is Ezekiel. And we're going to go from one to nine. It says, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the temple faced east. The water was coming out down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Uh, He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. As a man went eastward with a measuring line, measuring again in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, and then he led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through the water that was up to my waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was, was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. Remember the word Dead Sea. When it it empties into the sea, the salt water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever this water flows. It's the most beautiful picture of when God's presence flows, when his spirit flows, even the deadest place of the Dead Sea will be teemed with fish. And what we get is this picture of when you go to heaven, There's going to be life like you don't even know it. There's going to be no death and everywhere God is, it's just going to be life and life and everything you are sad about on this earth is going to be gone. It's going to be amazing. And I want to end with a warning. And a warning is this. It's the chasm in heaven. It says in verse 24 to 27. Let me read it to you just so we stick with the scripture. It says... The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day would its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The king, there will be kings in heaven. There will be nations in heaven. It will be a world governed by Jesus and God. There are these high walls made of one pearl. Pearls, by the way, when they make a pearl, it's an irritant and, and it's basically made for a lot of pain. And what these, rules, uh, these walls represent is two things for me, possibly. It's that everything you are going to receive was received because someone went through pain and his, his name is Jesus. He went through a great pain for your salvation. The walls are so high, it's significant because you will never have to worry 
worry about the enemy ever again because he was destroyed in the weeks before that we've seen. You are going to be in the safest place you had ever been in. The gates will never shut. It's not like New York that never ends and never shuts down. This is better. This is because all the threats will be gone and God will dwell with us all of the time. And there'll be no darkness and there'll be no night. It'll be good all the time. You South Africans that whinge about the weather in England through the winter, guess what? No problem for you in heaven. Yeah? No problem. And that just shows how many of them there are here. Stop it. But nothing impure will enter because this will be a perfect and pure place and evil corrupts and it spreads. You know, last couple of things before I just show an ending video. There's a, I was watching a bit more David Attenborough because I've got nothing better to do in my life. And I saw this picture of a sea angel. Wasn't that beautiful? That is a, yeah, do that. It's a sea angel. It's beautiful. Like what you can see in the sea angel when they eat, you can even see their food. And they're so cute. And it was just doing this. And I was like, you're so beautiful. Now show the next picture. Still looking beautiful? And this is such a picture. What it did is those tentacles came out and there was this snail floating around. It grabbed the snail and it sucked the life out of the snail and killed it and threw away. And I'm thinking, what happened to my angel, man? And But this is what Satan is like. He is masquerading like an angel of light. He looks beautiful and lovely. But if you get sucked into him, he will drain the life out of you and make you look a little bit like you do today. Like just not, just to, he will drain the light and he will entice you with this beautiful stuff, with the cars, the houses and everything else and the Netflix and anything that will take your mind. And he got you and his little tentacles to come out and he sucks the life out of you. You've all been through that. I've been through that. He's sucking the life out of people in this world. He looks good to start with and then he gets you. But I want to say to you, deny him now, resist him, flee from him. He will flee from you if you resist him. Do not let him into your life. And I want to say to you today that in heaven, nothing impure will enter. And all the things I've been teaching about, the book that I wrote about, seriously, it's real. Don't be taken in by the angel that then will suck the life out of you. And as he's doing in many churches. And the last thing on that is this, is that Jesus tells a parable about, it's not a parable because he uses real names. It's, a, uh, it's still not the parable, Mike. It's the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And the, the strange thing is the rich man ignores Lazarus, who is a pauper on his, his doorstep, doesn't even feed him with crumbs. And then he ends up, uh, Lazarus ends up in, in Abraham's bosom, which is in Hades. It's like the paradise side of Hades before heaven comes. And then you see the hellish side of Hades and you see that the rich man's there because he didn't care about people. And when he said, like, you know, could you get Lazarus to just dip his finger in water and come to me because it's painful here and horrible. And Abraham says, the chasm cannot be crossed. When you die, if you are not in Jesus, there's no return. When you die, if you find yourself in the bad place, there is no matter how much you're sitting there thinking, oh, God is good, he'll make a way. If you are on the wrong side of the chasm, you're not coming back. So do not, in your ignorance and arrogance, sit there today, if you don't believe, saying, I'll wait till my deathbed because you may not get a chance. You may be hit by a bus and you'll find you're on the wrong side of the chasm and there's no return. He's given you the chance today. Will you respond? Will you cross the chasm today? Because at the moment, unless you're in Christ, you're already on the wrong side of the chasm. But he's prepared this place for you. And in order to really ham it home, I'm going to show a video of a man that said it perfectly better than I can. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm looking forward to it with great anticipation because of what Jesus did on that cross. He died for us, but he was raised by God. I found during the latter years of my life when I've had sicknesses and been in the hospital and so forth, there's a peace that just resides there and stays there that I cannot explain. We all die. I'm not going to escape it. I don't want to escape it. I want to go. The vast majority of my life has already been lived. My record has already been made. I don't have very much longer. I know that. 
some of my closest friends and relatives, and especially my wife, are already in heaven. And because of the hope we have in Jesus, we can all be in heaven someday forever. A radical change must take place before you can get into heaven, before you can be accepted by God. You say, well, what do I have to do? You must repent of sin. You repent and you believe. Believe in Christ and you receive him in your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in and he'll come in. You don't have long. You'll be in eternity. And the decision you make tonight may decide where you'll be. And anybody can believe, a blind man can believe, a deaf man can believe, an old person can believe, a young person can believe. And that word believe means commit. I commit my life totally to him. The band want to come back. The most important thing you do on this earth is you yield to Jesus Christ. If that sounds arrogant to you, I don't care. Because Jesus is not, he doesn't need us, he wants us, he loves us. And he invites you. I wouldn't sit on the wrong side of the chasm. I'm not even going to make the appeal now. I'm just going to stand over there so you can come and see me at any time from the minute I step down from this lectern. And I'm going to just sit in that corner. If no one comes, not my problem. I know where I'm going. Where are you going? You can come and make that cross from the chasm today because of what Jesus has done. And the last thing I'd say, some people said to me a year ago, how, how are you coping so well with your mom's death? It's easy. I miss her but not for long. She's in heaven, and I intend to go there. What about you? Today, in that corner, you can come and book your ticket if you like. I'll be waiting. Lord, don't let anyone be swayed by the devil with lack of courage, because this is their eternity, and your heaven is so beautiful. Bring them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.